James chapter 1 in your Bible this morning, if you have it with you. James chapter number 1. Very special prayer need that I'll be mentioning at the conclusion of our service today, but I did want to mention, as James noted, this, this notion of Christmas out of the box. This December, I'm absolutely thrilled at, at what we've got going on through the holidays. I think it's going to be amazing. Uh, you may have noticed a sign-up sheet back in the back. There's a banner and a sign-up sheet. And here's the thing. We're not only going to be having our amazing candlelight service on the Sunday evening before Christmas, uh, but Christmas lands on a Sunday this year. So we'll be moving our service to 11, from 1045 to 11, and having that one, one simple, beautiful Christmas Day service on Sunday the 25th. But leading up to that, on the second Sunday of December, we're actually going to have some service projects that, that take our Christmas out of the box. And that's what we're asking you to sign up for. On that day, we will end our service and we'll have lunch provided for you. And then we're going to send out people all over the place, some on prayer teams to just go pray with our police department, pray with our firemen, uh, pray around City Hall, just, just asking God to do something great. Some folks are going to go and actually deliver gifts, deliver presents to some very needy families around Grand Prairie. Some are going to go and sing Christmas carols to our shut-ins and, and those who can't be in church. So what we're asking you to do today is just sign up for that. Let us know you're interested so we can start getting a count and getting ready for that. We won't have an evening service that night uh, because we'll be doing that in the afternoon and, and, and take a little over an hour probably just to go and bless somebody else during this Christmas season. Very excited about it. Make sure you sign up for that and looking forward to the holidays. Um, also, this morning, a brand new series that we're starting. Uh, before I get to that, many of you have asked me in relation to the, this election, where I was at, where I fall. Um, I, I'll tell you, I have wrestled and wrestled and wrestled with this one. And, and finally, the thing that made up my mind and heart was a particular sermon by a pastor in the Metroplex that really brought me to that tipping point and made up my mind. Uh, I realize many of you have probably already voted, but there are probably a number of you that have wrestled to the point you still just don't know what to do. Um, I'm not going to tell you what to do tonight, but I am going to tell you what I'm doing and why. And so this evening in our chapel, uh, we'll be showing a video of this sermon that, I, that speaks so well all that I would want to say to you on this topic. So tonight, if you can be here, a lot of you are in life groups tonight. That's fantastic. Go to your life group. We'll put this online on our website, a link to this sermon so you can catch it. But if you're available tonight, please come on out 6 p.m. across the street in our chapel. This morning, you probably noticed on your way in the light box posters with a new sermon series, two words in the form of a question. Why pray? Why pray? I, I think we could just as easily ask the question this morning, why come to church? Why give? When it comes to spiritual things, why bother? Every Sunday morning, preachers like myself, we find ourselves struggling with this sick little game we play, where as we're driving out of the parking lot, we're thinking, man, we had a good group today, but I noticed this one and that one and this one and that one and that one weren't here today. If they'd only been here, and I've been talking to them, and I've been counseling with them, and I've been praying for them, if only they were here, we would have had this many. If only they were here, it could have helped them. Every Sunday, I find myself fighting that game. The question could simply be, why come to church? Last Sunday, we had one of the lowest offerings in this church's recent history. We're talking 1980s numbers. And we could just as easily entitle this series, Why Give? Why Pray? I, listen, my inclination 
is to start rushing into all these reasons, this list of things as to why Christians, followers of Jesus, people who name the name of Christ, should pray. My inclination is to give you five points on why we should come to church and 12 points on why we ought to give and why spiritual things matter beyond what you can simply see, taste, hear, touch, and smell. This unseen world matters. I'm so inclined to just give reasons. But this morning, I felt God leading me in a different direction. Listen, y'all pray for me because I'm telling you, I want to tell the truth today in love. I don't want to back it off today. I don't want to hold back, but I don't want it to be Brian Loveless speaking out of the flesh. I want it to be the Holy Spirit of God speaking to you and me. I could give you reasons why we should, but I'm more and more convinced that's not really the issue. This is the issue. James 1.5. If any of you lack wisdom, let me stop there. Wisdom is the right application of knowledge. Wisdom is, God, I don't know how to live my life. I don't know how to raise my kids. I don't know exactly what to do, and I lack the willpower to do it. God, I need you. If any of you lack that, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. That means without reproach it shall be given him. God won't get mad at you for asking. But let him ask in faith nothing or without wavering or doubting. For he that wavereth, he that doubts, is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Think up, down. Let not that man think. Who? The man who doubts. The man who's up, then he's down. Then he's back, then he's... That he shall receive anything of the Lord. Wow. Before we go any further, he just said... God is so good and so merciful. If you ask him for wisdom and life, he'll give it to you. But if you're this up and down and back and forth, and maybe God's good and maybe he's not, and maybe I'll do it, and may, he said, don't bother. He won't answer you. Wow. And then he makes a statement, eight, a double-minded man is unstable uncertain in all his ways. Double-minded. Two minds. I I think as as modern 2016 Americans, we don't use double-minded very often, but mind and heart are so often synonymous in the Bible. When you think double-minded, think half Hearted. A half-hearted man, a half-hearted woman, a half-hearted teenager is unstable in all his ways. They're up, then they're down, they're here, then they're there. They will not be able to consistently walk with the Lord. I want to ask you a question this morning. Most every Christian in here, listen, you have some inkling of what God is calling you to. You have some inkling, maybe not specifics, but there's something in your heart that knows God wants me to live like this. God wants me to function like this. God wants me to be this kind of daddy, this kind of mom, this kind of student. God wants me to be this kind of believer, this kind of witness, this kind of citizen. Can I ask you a question this morning that I've had to ask myself very recently? What is holding you back?
Somebody asked me this last week, and I want to ask you, what are you afraid of? What is standing between you and God? I'm half-hearted. Why? This morning, I want to introduce you to a man who was the embodiment of James 1.8. Half-hearted. Knew God, was only partially committed to God. Knew the things of God, knew what he should do, but had a real hard time wanting what he needed. So he's up, and he's down, and he's back, and he's forth. He's the embodiment of James 1.8, but God was going to change all that. I want you to turn with me back to the first book of the Bible, Genesis 35. We're going to meet him this morning. Genesis 35. How many of you tuning in with me this morning? Say amen. Genesis 35. And let me talk why you turn. It's important to understand. The man named Jacob hadn't always been spiritually half-hearted. The fact is, back in Genesis 28, he's having some issues, and he's running away from home functionally, and the Bible says he comes to this particular place, and he has no bed, there's no hotel, he lays down, he gets a rock, and he puts his head on the rock, and he falls into a deep sleep, which becomes a vision. God gives him a vision of a ladder reaching from earth to heaven. And angels are ascending that ladder and descending that ladder. And God speaks to Jacob from the heavens above and says, this land where you're sleeping is going to be yours, your descendants. I'm going to multiply you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to use you. And Jacob wakes up in something akin to a terror. And he makes this comment, surely the Lord's in this place. And up till a moment ago, I knew it not. Here's what happened. He knew theologically about God, but in that moment, he met him. That place was thick with God. He could feel him. He was moved emotionally. He was moved mentally. God became real to Jacob. God's promises became real to Jacob. And I want to read this to you, Genesis 28, 16. Jacob awaked out of his sleep and said, Surely the Lord's in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put for his pillow, and he set it up for a pillar, and he poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, God, if you're really this big and really this good so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone which I've set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth, a tithe, back to you. What was he saying? God, if you're real, if you're really going to do this, if these promises are true, God, here's my life. If you're going to do all that, I'm yours. Do you remember that moment, Christian, when God got your undivided attention? For some of you, it's been a long time since God had your undivided attention. Remember that moment when he was real to your heart? Remember that moment where he convicted you of something going on in your life, something going on in your relationships, something going on that was a barrier between you and him, and you wept your heart out like you hadn't before, and you surrendered to God, God, and you felt the weight of the world come off your shoulders, and you just thought, if I could live here, if I could live here, I'd stay right here for the rest of my life. There's so much joy, there's so much peace, there's so much power being in the presence of God. 
Well, that's where Jacob is. But here's the thing. By the time we hit our text, ten long years have passed. And Jacob has been avoiding that place like the plague. He won't go near Bethel. He's in Shechem. It's 15 miles from there. He constantly makes journeys to a city on the other side of Bethel. But apparently he goes around it. He avoids that place where he gave himself to God fully like the plague. And that's what some of y'all are doing. Running. Fighting. Medicating. That pace is cranked up to 90 miles an hour in your life all the time so you don't have to get quiet and you don't have to get real. You're on that hamster wheel. You're not getting anywhere, but there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of movement. That's where Jacob was. Ten years of that. And listen, God, who loves him too much to allow him a cheap substitute life. God, who adores him too much to let him die hugged up on counterfeit comforts. is going to take that hand of protection off and is going to let him feel what it is to do things your way. Is he punishing him? No. He's letting him feel the effects of trying to be your own little God. His life descends into misery. He's got terrible problems with his father-in-law, Laban, in Genesis 31. He finally hooks up with a dude who's more crooked than he is. He has problems with his wives, plural. Notice I said wives, two wives, Rachel and Leah. That means not just two wives, but two mother-in-laws. God help him. He has problems with his brother. His brother hates him, wants to kill him. But the straw that breaks the camel's back is he starts having problems with his kids. In the verses preceding our text, we find that Dinah, Jacob's only daughter, he has all these boys, but he's got this daughter. That daddy-daughter relationship, this is his baby girl. And he's hard on those boys, man, but he's easy on Dinah. He loves her. He treasures her. And Dinah goes out, the Bible says, to see the daughters of the land, to tour the area, to hang out with some friends. And in a tragic turn of events, Dinah is raped by a man named Shechem. And her two brothers, Levi and Simeon, in seeking revenge for their sister, butcher Shechem and go and wipe out all of his family. And now here's Jacob in the land, surrounded by people who will want vengeance for that family's death, and his daughter's been hurt, and his boys are bowed up in their neck and disrespectful to their father, and he's finally at the point where he's seeing, trying to be my own God hasn't worked very well. And he comes to the point, he says, my whole family, we're... we're, We're going to be done. God impressed this message on me for a reason, y'all. Some of you are feeling the walls coming in. Life's getting tight. Or you're seeing the handwriting on the wall. That trying to be your own God and living a long way from Bethel and living this half-hearted, listen, you're starting to feel it. 
This leads us to our text, Genesis 35, 1. And God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there. I want you to go back to Bethel, and I don't want you to visit. I want you to live there. And make there an altar unto God that appearest unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. I want to entitle our time together for these last few moments that we have. Don't get nervous, newcomers. My title comes real late in the message. The Cure for Half-Hearted Christianity. God has been moving me lately that I, I've been so prone to personalize every setback our church has had. To personalize when people don't show up. What am I doing wrong? To personalize when people don't follow through. Where's our programming off that it doesn't inspire? And listen, there's some truth to that. I always want to be a better leader. I always want to move us forward. But I'm telling you, from the Holy Spirit of God, a whole chunk of our problem is here. People who are halfway in. Half-hearted. Not committed yet to a life given over to Jesus. Brent, no program the church can put on can solve that for you. But this can. <laughs> the cure for half-hearted Christianity, number one. To come back to Bethel in our best moments, we want to come back to Bethel. Oh God, I'm tired. I'm weary. I just heard a sermon and it moved me. I just heard a song and it put me in tears. I just talked to a friend and it made me want to give my life to Jesus. I'm so tired of that way and I want to give my life to you, but I'm scared of myself because I know how half-hearted I am. You know what? First of all, we have to release our grip on the world. Look at Genesis 35, 2. God says, go back to Bethel. Then Jacob said to his household and all that were with him, put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean and change your garments and let us arise and go up to Bethel and I'll make there an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods, the idols which were in their hand and all their earrings. It's not a fashion statement. It's not making a negative statement toward fashion. Earrings in that day oftentimes were used to typify slavery. I'm enslaving myself to this God. I'm yielding myself to them because they give me some fringe benefit. They gave him the earrings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. The moment God says, for real, I want you to come to Bethel and I want you to live there. Jacob knows what's been keeping him on the outskirts. They had other gods. I don't know if it was Molech or Ashtaroth or the gods of the sun, the god of the moon, the god of rain, the fertility god, these gods of the people around them. Listen, there was some kind of blessing you felt you incurred if you worshipped them. So their deal wasn't that they were anti-God. They were just pro-idol. I can hold hands with both and be absolutely fine. And Jacob, in the back of his heart, knew these things are stealing my heart from God. I can't go back to Bethel like this. So he didn't go back to Bethel for 10 years. And the moment God says, come, Jacob says, these things have got to go because we can't do both. Here's the deal. I doubt you have an idol in your house that you bow down and pray to. If you do, I'm fascinated. Let's talk after the service. But you know what? 
Your God is that which claims your best energy, your best affection, and your best attention. That's your God. You can worship Jehovah academically and worship any number of things or people or institutions with your heart, your time, your affection, you. You know why a lot of us don't come back to Bethel? We don't have time. We don't have time to worship where we're worshiping and worship there too. James 4, 8, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. You're double-minded. What are the areas in your life What are the areas in your family that God has been dealing with you about for weeks, for months, maybe even for years? You made all kinds of excuses, given all kinds of reasons. But what are the idols in it? What is getting more of your attention than God? What is getting more of your money than God? What is giving more of your passion than God? Friend, that's your God. Can you imagine me coming home to Jenny, who's home with my youngest, Vance has strep throat this morning, me coming home this afternoon and saying, Honey, I love you, you're my heart, you're my soul but I'm really thinking about taking up with a girlfriend. There would be a homicide, brother. She's small, but she's strong. Can you imagine how perverted that would be? I don't love you enough to give you me, but I'll give you part of me. I want to say this because I love you. Man, I'm talking straight today, and it's time to talk straight. There's a bunch of you in this auditorium. You are giving God your garbage. Your leftover time, your leftover energy, your leftover money. If there's a scrap left at the end of the month, you'll kick it to God like he's a dog. And I want to tell you, he's calling you back to Bethel. Here's the second thing. You must release your grip on the world. You must return to the house of God. You know what Bethel means? House of God. He says, Jacob, I I don't want you to visit. I want you to live there. So Jacob came to Luz, which is in the land of Canaan, that is Bethel, he and all the people that were with him. It's interesting because when Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 3.15, he used that same phrase. If I tarry long, I want you to know how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Listen, being an active member of a body... Doing life with people, serving them, having them serve you, giving and loving and attending. Listen, that won't make you spiritual. There are people who show up every time the doors are open who don't even know Christ. But I want to say this real straight. Over 20 years of ministry, I've come to affirm it and believe it. A direct metric for your spirituality is if you are forsaking the assembling of yourselves together with other Christians, friend, you are not walking with Jesus. You're not. I love you. This ain't an individual sport. Those Dallas Cowboys at noon, oh, it's at noon, does he know? I know, that's why you DVR'd it. I'm so glad you DVR'd it. Dak can go out on the field and do his thing all day long, but without those other 10... It ain't happening. 
This was designed to be a community endeavor, and you can't do it by yourself. I don't need a church to walk with Jesus. Nonsense. Yeah, you do. They need you, and you need them. And Christ will put you in a body. What is it that is keeping you from the house of God? We need you. We notice when you're gone. What's keeping you from plugging in with other believers and saying, you know what? I'm going to live in Bethel. Adrian Rogers said to parents, that great old preacher, man, alive, the way he said it, I could never get near it. Do you know what you say to your children when you don't make church attendance a regular habit? You're saying it's nice, but it's not a necessity. But when you go to work every day, the kids know that's a necessity. When you get them to sports every day, the kids know that's a necessity. Teach your children what's really important. God help us to do that. Final thing is this. The cure for half-hearted Christianity, release your grip on the world, return to the house of God, renew your altars. Genesis 35, 7, and he built there an altar and he called the place El Bethel because there God appeared unto him when he fled from the face of his brother. They get rid of their idols. They make the journey. They come on back to Bethel and he renames it El Bethel, which means not just house of God, but mighty God of the house of God. Here's the thing. I found this out firsthand. You can come to church day in and day out. You can do all the programs. You can be here, but unless you develop a relationship with a living God, it won't matter he lives he's real I read something this week man that that is a sermon by Tony Evans that put me on my back it put me on my knees in prayer it said there's a direct correlation between the supernatural and how filled with a spirit you are if the spirits only got a little bit of you you will seldom see the supernatural If he is allowed to flow through your life, in other words, you make him Lord, you will see the supernatural on a regular basis. God help us. If we're not seeing the supernatural, it's because we're not giving over to him. It's because we're not living in Bethel. But God says, I'm inviting you. Come rebuild the altars. Come rebuild that altar of prayer. How long has it been since you said every morning, I'm going to have that little time with the Lord. I'm going to light my candle. I'm going to kneel down. I'm going to do whatever it is that calms me and gives me the ability to just focus on God. But I'm going to set aside the time to meet with Him. I'm going to read that Bible. I'm going to dust it off. It's not enough to just get it from Brian. i got to get it from me. I'm going to renew the altar of worship with my family. My kids right now, they love those little songs. I want to make sure I nurture that. I don't want to give Vance more SpongeBob than Jesus. I don't want to give Aubrey more volleyball than the Holy Spirit. Because here's the thing. If she winds up the the greatest athlete who's ever lived and she doesn't love Jesus, who cares? If he winds up the most famous kid who's ever lived and he doesn't know God, who cares? God help us to develop a relationship. That takes T-I-M-E. The altar of stewardship. Man, I'm prone to live life on the upgrade, aren't you? I get a little more money, and that simply means nicer car, nicer stuff, nicer hobbies, nicer. When the cause of Jesus Christ is all around us. Jacob goes back to Bethel, and God effectively says, Jacob, welcome home. I'm going to give you the joy you had before. I'm going to give you the peace you had before. I'm going to renew the promises I gave you before.
turn back to where you left him. And you will find him there. He's waiting by your bedside where you used to kneel in prayer. He's standing in the chapel by that long abandoned pew. You are older, wiser, broken. You're tired of self, it's true. So return to where you left him. He's waiting there for you. Would you bow your heads with me all over this place? The message I heard this week from Dr. Tony Evans, last week y'all heard me preach a sermon on living water. It bubbles up inside and lets us taste of Christ. So real. So beautiful. It pushes all of our other passions to the background. And it's no coincidence that Dr. Evans was preaching on water in the house of the Lord. He came out of Ezekiel when there's a picture of the temple with water running out toward the east from its altars. And that living water pouring out of the temple is pouring toward the Dead Sea. And it's called the Dead Sea because nothing that lives can live in it. But that water pouring out of the temple, everything it touches, it brings to life. Every plant, every old set of animal bones comes to life when it hits that water. And that water flows, starts out ankle deep, then knee deep, then waist deep, then you swim in it. Then it pours into the Dead Sea and brings the Dead Sea to life. You know what that's a picture of? The church pouring life into a community like Grand Prairie where everything it touches goes from death to life. But you know what Dr. Evans said? You can't bring your community to life if there's no life in the church. If there's no water in the house of God, there's no water for Grand Prairie, Texas. If God isn't strong enough for us to worship, why would those broken people outside want him? If God's a 98-pound weakling in this house, he'll be anemic out on those streets. I don't know what the future holds for our church, I know some churches, like people, have a birth and a life and a death. Does God have to have Calvary? Does he need us? No, he doesn't. But I believe he wants to use us. But a bunch of us are going to have to come back to Bethel. There's no program we can institute, no sermon I can preach, no way we can try to compete we got to come back to Bethel and give our hearts to him. I'm going to pray. Brandon's going to lead us in worship. Back to Bethel. Back to Bethel. Father, today I'm so conscious that without you we can do nothing Jesus without you we can do nothing to will is present with us but not how to perform that which you've commanded our spirit is willing this morning our flesh is very weak so God we have to have you do this work in our hearts 
to call us back to Bethel. We have to have you do this work in our circumstances to bring us back to the place where you get number one, where we start seeking you again, where we lay down some stuff that is stealing you from us. God, I pray for a work of conviction here today. I feel it in me. You're changing my schedule now, Lord. You're bringing me back to some basic things. Oh, God, do what only you can do. And Lord, there's that person here today. I know this is a message in so many ways for the church, but there's somebody here that's never tasted of that living water. And Jesus, thank you. They don't have to be good enough or smart enough or, or undo the wrongs they've done. Jesus, you died for them. You'll let them drink of that water for free, the water of eternal life. So I pray God do a work in us we can't do for ourselves. Bring us back to Bethel. Call us back to Bethel to live there. God, let this place send out streams of living water to change this community. We thank you for what you'll do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.